Ladies, gentlemen, and destined ones of all ages, as we all return to Monkey and begin our journey through Black Myth Wukong, you may find yourself wondering if your wanderings have been incomplete, if perhaps there are things that you've left undone or didn't find when heading through the game initially, and so today we're going to go over all of the important secrets in Chapter 1 of Black Myth Wukong, as well as a good chunk of the earlier ones in Chapter 2 as well, because there's some quite important ones there. And I will be going generally in progression order, so you can follow along as you play if you'd like without fear of being spoiled for stuff that's just way ahead of where you are. But fair warning that one of the later entries will be just be doing some jumping bit around between chapter one and chapter two because of how it actually functions. That said, first things first, the earliest secret is a missable key item from the Forest of Wolves, Front Hills, Temple Shrine. If you head forward just along the path, you will come to a fork. On your right side will be the first mini boss where you unlock your first spell. But if you take a left towards the river, there is a monkey fellow on top of a stone head. You'll watch him leave in a mini little cutscene, and then you can interact with the head to find the Skanta of form, a key item. What it does, who knows, but a key item is a key item, it'll come up later, and you can easily just turn right and go through the boss instead. Second up then, we have the Wandering White Mini Boss. This is near the Forest of Wolves, outside the Forest Temple Shrine. When you first come here, you are turned into a Cicada, but forward along the path and immediately right is this Mini Boss. The main reason that you are a Cicada here in the first place is to offer you the option of slipping past this Mini Boss completely unseen, because it is just a fair bit above the player's pay grade this early in the journey. Being far harder hitting and harder to kill than most most bosses in this chapter. You can also run around him purposefully, well, not in cicada form, it just makes it easier the first time that you are here. The secret here is first, if you didn't know, this guy is optional, you can skip him, you can run around him purposefully and go by him and just come back to kill him later, even in further chapters, as you can return to earlier chapters. But also, because of that, let's talk about what you get for killing him if you do choose to do so, which is the Cat Eye Beads Curio, which raises your critical strike chance, as well as the Wandering White Spirit Skill, that is a super close range bowing headbutt attack attack, applying high damage and stagger if you are close enough to actually hit. It also gives you 20 defense just passively by having it on, which is actually quite strong the earlier that you're able to get it, as 20 defense very early, like in chapter 1, is nearly as much as a whole base armor set at that point in the game. Past that, partially because of this cicada form as well, and the fact that the main path is behind the previous entry's boss, there is actually another missable boss in the outside the forest temple shrine area that I've seen a surprising amount of people not catch. This one specifically, if you follow the lit torches in the area the first time that you're there, it will bring you to the leader of the Wolf Gwai forces, which is quite a fun little boss fight to have with a double-sided flaming glaive on the guy. This is arguably a fairly easier fight than the Wandering White is, or even the main path boss for the area too, but it is an extremely valuable boss to do for two separate reasons. When you win, you get to take his weapon, which unlocks your first transformation magic skill, allowing you to change form and adopt part of his moveset, while also getting basically a bonus health bar to play around with. And this is an extremely strong ability to be able to pull out for just any other fight in the near future, as it just provides you with a lot of free aggression to be able to apply once in a while. The other main thing from here then is the bell that happens behind the boss after you kill them. You can walk up to it and then just interact with it once they're dead. This won't do anything for now immediately, but it will help out later on. Fourth today, we have a full on optional boss in a much more missable sense, and specifically from the Bamboo Grove Snake Trail Temple Shrine, also in chapter one. The main path is forward and upwards, but if instead you head through the destroyed building to the left, you can jump down into the river. Follow this along to its end, and you will find your prey, a Yao Guai chief toad enemy who is honestly quite a cool little encounter, and the reward for defeating him is his own spirit to use in combat as well, shooting out his tongue forwards back and forth in a sweeping attack motion, and this one gives you a passive effect that reduces stamina cost for jumping and jump-based attacks. Next up is main path adjacent. After the frog boss, the next major enemy along the main path is Guang Mo, but after defeating him, the main path is noted with the torches heading right, but there is another path that leads behind where the boss was guarding to another giant bell that is hanging and unrung. Interact with this and ring it, and like the earlier bell, this is actually part of a greater secret to come, just a little bit of a touch later on. Sixth then, this one is pretty much main path, but it's too important not to mention just in case, literally right across from the left of the Marsh of the White Mist Temple Shrine, you can find hanging glowing yellow vines. This is a plant that you can pick up, and you want to make sure that you do so, because this is the material that you use to increase healing gourd uses. It's very important. This is easily just ran by in haste before you know what it is, but once you do know, you know to keep an eye out for this one, and for more of them later on. Seventh up, further in the March of the White Mist area, you immediately find a proper boss for this zone, and once you have defeated the boss located here, a path will open up beyond them into a cave on the right that is just very obvious that the game wants you to go through there. This is the correct path 
four main progress, but there's also a sort of hard to notice secondary area that you can go through, which is a cave tunnel in the background. If you follow this through, you'll find a number of wolves surrounding the final of three bells for chapter one. Ring the spell, and with the other two already rung, you will unlock the full secret area of this chapter, Ancient Guanyin Temple. This is a short and simple area a shrine to rest at, and then right across from the shrine to the right of it, that is three chests surrounding a tree. Inside one of these chests is an arm slot item called Guanyin's Prayer Beads, with relatively high defense for the stage of the game, and the unique effect of increasing your maximum health and mana for a period of time after absorbing Lingering Will. But that's not all, because there is one other chamber of the secret area, and it houses a boss and nothing else. That boss being named Elder Jin Chi. He has a bunch of little zombie guys that will help him through the fight, but otherwise he is mostly just a much quicker and more advanced version of the Wandering White mini-boss fight from earlier on. With a mention that he does have a really unique move at 50% health, but I'd rather let you experience that for yourself without showing you here, and this is just a really neat fight for sure, honestly. It's definitely worth doing, and as a reward for defeating him, you will get a pile of will, along with an entirely new type of tool at the stage that you won't get another one of for a while, the Fireproof Mantle Vessel. This makes you immune to burn buildup entirely, while also granting focus over time for a short duration after use. It also has the passive effect of general burn resistance and immunity to scorched damage from lava terrain, which means that you can use this for traversal through specific later game areas. Moving on to the final area of chapter one then, from Blackwind Cave, outside the Cave Temple Shrine, you want to progress forward along the path, ideally using the newly acquired Cloud Strike for stealth, and instead of following the main path up along the wooden bridges, drop down to the left to find the wolf assassin enemy beside a chest. Not only is he guarding this chest that you can open for some goodies once he's dead, but if you kill him, he will actually drop his soul for you to collect into your gourd as an equipable spirit move, which throws out knives at range when used, and has the passive effect of just increasing your general crit chance by 3%, which isn't bad at all. But with that then, we're going to be moving on to chapter two. Right out of the gate from the starting spot, you progress into a river, and if you head up along the path to your right, instead of following along the river, you will find a little altar with the Lamb's Gourd Drink. This is an alternate healing gourd, and this one, rather than giving 33% health back immediately, gives 20% straight up, and then a further 25% over time. So this is more health per drink overall, but it is less immediate safety, so it is a bit more dangerous to actually use. Past that, at the next shrine, the Village Entrance Shrine, head down and right into the ditch running under the wooden bridge, follow this to the end of the little pathway to find a friendly NPC that you can talk to. He will explain his problems, and you can solve them for him by fighting another optional boss. This one being another toad found just in the pond nearby him just over the ridge, and this one has a more advanced moveset compared to the earlier toad boss. It is a shock toad, it has a lot of electric based moves, and a lot of synergies that make it much more interesting than the previous one, it's not just a copy, so don't underestimate this one. For defeating the toad though, you get a formula to bring back to the fox man, and he will use this to unlock your crafting to affect a bunch of more standard consumables as well, so you can craft medicine, which does things like increase your damage reduction, increase your damage, increase a whole bunch of different resistances, these are really good, it's why you've been collecting crafting materials up to this point, and it's a great thing to be able to use if you're ever in a fight that is causing you any sort of issues, just make some consumables and use them, they are worth it for sure. From the place where you talked to the fox doctor then, head up the stairs along the balcony, and then at the top there are more obvious things along the main path, but another optional boss lays all the way in the back of this area and then left if you follow the alleyway behind the houses. In this large open area then, as you turn the corner, you will find another optional boss, the earth wolf. The main reward for this pretty cool and unique enemy, honestly, is the earth wolf spirit for a charging high stagger spirit attack, and the passive effect of this is a small bonus to focus gained on hit. As well, this gives the progression of a side quest line, as a familiar friendly NPC will be in this area tied up afterwards after you met him in the first chapter. The next thing that you will come across majorly is the main progress boss for this section, however there are actually two ways to do this fight, as it is a duo fight against a king and a prince. If you kill the prince, the fight will end and the king will disappear, to come back later on in the adventure. If you kill the king first, the prince will enrage and become much harder to fight, much more damaging, much more aggressive, but at the end of the fight you will get to absorb his soul and take his spirit as a usable item, which you simply cannot not do unless the king dies first. The best way to force this to happen is just put the prince to low health, then bully the king to death, then kill the prince, because if the prince enrages at high health, the fight gets significantly harder, so you might as well just do that at when he's actually much lower to begin with. As for the reward then, the spirit that you get from this gives you a leaping mace smash with high stagger like the boss's actual attack, and the passive effect of having it equipped is a boost to attack power when at low health, for those who like to live life a little bit dangerously. Right after this boss then, if you head to the left, you will find the shrine for this that you can unlock after killing it, and after behind this shrine you will actually find a tunnel with a rat guard blocking the front. Head through here and drop down immediately into the big open pit in front of you, and if you did not kill the king in the last fight, a boss fight will begin here automatically when you drop down. If you did
did kill the king, you won't get the boss fight to start unless you walk up to the empty edge and interact with the item that you got for killing the king. This will spawn another optional boss that is related to that fight, and through this fight, you will want to actually get the boss to hit the wall that is located over here. Alternatively, if you've already fought the boss, or you don't want to, but you still want the secret item, if you use the withering white spirit item, the big headbutt that we got earlier in the secret collection, you can use it on this wall to actually crack it open and make an opening the same way that the boss attacks would, and then you can traverse inside of it. Inside of here are the long scales, which are used to traverse waterfalls in Black Myth Wukong. Yeah, you heard me correctly for traversing waterfalls. From here, our next secret then is actually back in chapter one, because that is where the first waterfall is that I deliberately did not mention until we had the way to access it. From the outside the forest temple shrine, follow the path forwards and left until you reach the big guy that is guarding a chest, and instead of taking the bridge on the right, take a left, and then follow this to the end of the path, where you will find a crow man guarding a waterfall. Defeat the crow man, and now that you have the item that we just got, you can use your interact button in front of the waterfall to make it let you through. I really honestly don't want to spoil the boss in here at all, other than saying it is an incredibly cool and special fight, and that all of these waterfalls that you can find and open are totally worth doing. This does give you a bunch of material resources when you kill it though, as well as the Tiger Tally Curio, which gives you bonus damage reduction when you are out of healing gourd charges. This, however, is not the main reason to do this fight. That would be because it also unlocks a new craftable weapon, the Long Wreath Staff, which is a relatively early unlockable epic rarity staff with 70 base attacks, so extremely solid for how early you unlock it, to put it simply. As for how to get the rest of the materials you need to make it though, because this isn't all of them, that comes from the next and final entry for our list. In chapter two, from the point that we left things get a little bit open, but if you head across the wooden bridge from the Prince and King boss fight, you will enter the Fright Cliffs region. The second waterfall of the game is near the Rock Rest Flat Temple Shrine in the Fright Cliffs, specifically up the stairs to the right of the shrine. If you follow these all the way up to the top, you will find this mirage-like waterfall of sand, but before you can interact with this one, you have to kill the Spearbone enemy right in front of it. This specific one will drop a usable spirit that gives you a shield and a ranged AoE stagger effect on use, with the passive effect of this being equipped being slight damage reduction increase. Once the Spearbone enemy is dead, then interact with the waterfall to access another really cool secret boss and another really missable one as well, and it is quite a difficult one compared to the other things in the same area. Suffice to say, these waterfall guys are pretty special, but the important thing to note is the rewards for them, which are the other materials required to craft that sick weapon that we were just looking at and talking about, as well as the Tridacna Pendant Curio for a slight cooldown reduction on all skills. That just about does it for today then everyone, every secret in chapter one of Black Myth Wukong, as well as the majority of them along the first sort of half of chapter two as well, so that we can actually unlock the final one of chapter one. If you enjoyed this and got use out of it, then let us know in the comments and we'll do more for further points in the game than this. But hopefully this relatively early guide to avoid missing out on stuff in Black Myth Wukong helps you out in your continued journey to the West. Like if you liked the video, subscribe to the notification bell for more, and most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, until next time, stay sweet. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world our stage Is, uh, goodbye